Think about what science does. Here's all these disparate phenomena, and I get, have a unifying understanding. And then here's two different theories. Here's Darwinian natural selection. Here's Mendelian genetics. And I get, the, I get modern evolutionary theory, the, the grand synthesis, right? And why, what, and why are scientists trying to find the ultimate? Yeah, and those are profound syntheses, and they're profound because they point to a deep underlying unity. Exactly, exactly. And this is the Neoplatonic argument. And then, and then you add in the argument I did at length in Ralston, if reality isn't, or if that fundamental grammar of intelligibility doesn't conform to a fundamental grammar of Yes, how right, right. That's, we, are, yeah. we are doomed. We, yeah, are, yeah. We, are, we are doomed yeah. to a, a radical solipsism, a radical, so mm-hmm. it's not, you can't, you, I, I would argue, and I, I would ask people to look at the longer argument at Ralston, but you can't take the Kantian position that, yes, that is the grammar of intelligibility, but reality is somehow fundamentally different. Because, mm-hmm. like, just, like Clark's argument, different Clark, Samuel Clark, right? like Kant presupposes the existence of other minds with an epistemology that gives him no way of acknowledging the existence of other minds. Why is he writing the damn critique if he doesn't think, why is he upset when he doesn't get the reception? Because he believes that there are other minds, right, that, and, they, and, they're, and they're real and they're out there and he somehow has access to them and, and they have alternative frame. Like, right, so his implicit presuppositions he's and his a, explicit he's, presuppositions don't match. He's in a performative contradiction, like yes, why they yes, talk yes, to yes, us. Yes, yes, yes. And so if you, and, and so the Neoplatonic argument is not the particulars, but the grammar of intelligibility and the grammar of reality has to ultimately... Okay, okay. Ultimately so this, this is actually really why I wanted to talk to you today. So, <laughs> so this, this issue here. So I did a lecture for Ralston as well at Ephesus on the Greek idea of the logos. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so I, wanna, I, want to, I want to ask you some questions about this. And I suppose Please. this has something to do possibly with Neoplatonism and Buddhism and Christianity. Having a VPN is an important first step towards protecting your online privacy, but choosing a VPN you trust is equally as important. We here at Daily Wire Plus choose ExpressVPN to secure our internet connection because unlike other cheap or free VPNs that make money by selling your data to advertisers, ExpressVPN has developed a technology that makes it impossible for their servers to store your data. ExpressVPN is the only VPN you can really trust. Plus, using ExpressVPN doesn't slow your internet connection. Their new lightweight protocol makes user speeds faster than ever. You can even stream HD videos with zero buffering. As complicated as all that might sound, ExpressVPN is incredibly easy to use. Just fire up the app and tap one button to connect. It's no wonder why CNET, Business Insider, The Verge, and many other tech journals rate ExpressVPN the number one VPN in the world. Protect your online activity with the VPN we trust here at Daily Wire Plus. Visit expressvpn.com slash jordanyt right now and find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash jordanyt. Expressvpn.com slash jordanyt. Let's, we'll, we'll open with a question about what might constitute this ultimate unity. Now, you could think about it as a phenomenological unity in some sense and, and put it in the objective space, but, but I want to make a different case. So I think the ultimate unity is better conceptualized as something that you might term a spirit, and, and we can get into your discussion. Yeah, Jonathan, spirit, and I, well. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so a spirit is an animating principle or a set of animating principles. Yes, yes. And a universal spirit would be the same set of animating principles, animating a lot of people simultaneously, yes, right? Yes. So uh, um, it's like a meme in, in, the, in the Dawkins sense, right? It's like a hyper meme. And so the question is, well, why should you conceptualize that as a spirit? So let me offer a proposition about what's happening in the biblical corpus. Okay. So, okay, so there's some attempt to specify the implicit unity. And the way the biblical corpus does that is by laying out a sequence of narratives. And the narratives stress a different yes. ultimate unity. Right. So, for example, in the story of Noah, here's the unity that's being pointed to. So you have Noah characterized as someone who's a wise man for his time and place, which is all, any, all of us, anything, all any of us could hope for. Yeah. Now, Noah has an intuition that the storms are coming, and he has faith in the intuition and acts on it. And then God is characterized as the source of the intuition. And faith, in Noah's case, is characterized as the mm-hmm. willingness to abide by that intuition. That's the story. 
against and then, all the people that are criticizing him. And again. against all other things that might occupy his attention. Yes, he yes. prioritizes that. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so he met that, and that's how he manifests faith in it. That's right. Okay, so now another story bumps up against that. And the next story is the Tower of Babel. Yeah. And, and they're very different narrative. And so what you have here is this, and this is actually related to this problem of criticality, but we won't go into that. You have this proposition that human beings can build these towers of abstraction that can become totalitarian in yes, their essence, yes, right? Yes. And that God punishes that. Yeah, he destroys he, yeah, yeah, he fragments them. He, he fragments it and makes people confused. Yeah. Okay, so now that's a very different picture of God, yes, yeah. the Noah God. Yeah. Okay, but they're contiguous. Yeah. They, they call that metonymy. Yeah. So there's uh, an implication by juxtaposition that there's an identity between those two different things, yeah. but they're very diverse. Okay, so then I'll just do two more of these. So yeah. then you have the story of Abraham. Yeah. Now, Abraham is a slow starter, right? So he's very wealthy. His parents are wealthy. He lives a very privileged and sheltered life. But a spirit makes itself manifest to him, and the spirit is the call to adventure. Yeah. And so God in the Abrahamic story is the spirit that calls even the comfortable out to the cat catastrophic adventure of their yeah, life. Yeah. And that's juxtaposed against these other two spirits. Then you have, let's say, Moses. Now, you have a different characterization of the ultimate unity. And the ultimate unity in the story of Moses is the unity that announces itself in yeah. the burning bush, but exactly. also the spirit that punishes the tyrant yeah. and that calls the slaves out of slavery. And, okay, and so now... The open future, too. Meaning? The gods of Egypt are gods of location and function. The god of Moses, and even... More, even so this is a development of the god of Abraham... The God of Moses travels with people through space and time into an open future that they right, make. Right, right, right. Okay, and that's a, that's a reference, as far as I can tell, back to the opening lines of Genesis because God characterizes himself at the beginning of the book of Genesis, I think, in terms that are very much akin to the terms we've been using to describe consciousness itself because God is the thing that confronts the pluripotential chaos. And that's really, if you look at what, uh, what is, what's the word, teo... Tohu vabohu. That's really what it means. It means pluripotential chaos. It's something mm. like that. He confronts that pluripotential chaos and generates habitable or the habitable order that is good out of it. And that's the image of God in man. Those are identified as the same thing. And this is so crucial because it also implies. So one of the questions my students used to always ask me is, how do you know that what you're teaching us isn't just another ideology? Because yeah. I was trying to teach counter ideology, and that's a really good question, it's right? A, it's the but question, right? It is. Now. It is the question. But if if imagine that you could have a story that concentrates on the process by which functional stories are generated. Well, this is what I wanted to say to you. I think what you're getting. I mean, uh, a spirit is something like a multiply realizable, like you know, generative function. What I mean yeah, by that yeah. is you're trying to find the through line. Each one of the think about. Remember I did the multidimensional opponent processing? Each one of these narratives is an opponent processing. You're, uh, right, yeah, it's right? Cain versus Abel. Yeah, and there's this, and uh, but there's also, right, there's Egypt versus the promise. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. Egypt yeah, is yeah. Exploit, conflict. But, but, but Egypt is exploit the here now or explore the there then. Mm-hmm that we talked about at the core of relevance. Remember they talk about the flesh pots of Egypt this, like the, the, this, you, but if we stay here, right, there's so much we could just exploit, but, but you're Right, well, that's what the Israelites get, get uh, what would you, nostalgic about when they're in the desert exactly. too, is, right? Their immediate needs are no longer being gratified and that causes them to become faithless and, and, and fractious. So what I'm, I'm suggesting to you is like, I'll just use the, the, the Exodus story though, is you, as one of, it, but all of them, I would argue, what myth is always doing we're often doing, and, and Levi Strauss had sort of a sense of this with structuralism. But what it's it's doing is it's pointing you to opponent processing, and, 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 and then you can think of okay, here's this myth with this opponent processing, here's this myth with this opponent processing. What's the through lines? And then what I do is I, I I try to find like like what you're doing, what I was talking about earlier. You're trying to find the multi-dimensional. Yeah. Like Nexus, the through line of the meta of uh, the meta like, through line, yeah, of all the opponent processing. You're trying to you're trying to say, okay, all of the relevance realization. If I if I could do all the trade offs, this is Nicholas of Cusa with his open sense of infinity. Infin in the ancient Greek world, inf infinity is a bad thing; it's chaos. But with Cusa, it opens up into and then the whole Neoplatonic tradition into a positive thing. It's like no, no. If I could get all of the of all of the opposites. 
I would see that in infinity, they all coincide, the coincidence of the opposites. Right, oh, right? Oh, oh, oh. And that would be the culmination, not in, in, in any entity, that would be sort of the summation of what our cognition is about. It, mm -hmm. it would be sort of, I would have found the source of intelligibility because I would have moved to the deepest grammar of cognition, mm -hmm. which would get me. And that's the resolution of all opposing conflicts.